Hello friends. Today we are going to discuss about a unique philosopher from medieval history. In the medieval political thought, Indian political thought, there are many philosophers. The philosophers belong to Bhakti movement. The philosophers belong to Hinduism, Sufism, and the philosophers belong to Islam. In today's class, we'll be discussing about Jiauddin Barani. Jiauddin Barani belongs to 14th century, and he was an Islamic philosopher who propagated the ideal sultan or the theory of kinship and also ideal polity in his uh, renowned writings. Jiauddin Barani was a 15th century philosopher, 14th century philosopher. And he was a scholar in the court of Muhammad bin Tughlaq. And he is in the company of many scholars of that time. And we'll be discussing about his contemporary times and various other things. So medieval Indian political thought, Jiauddin Barani occupies a very prominent role. And his uh, theory is very well known and famous for the theory of kinship kingship that's called ideal sutta. So in the Western philosophy, we have seen Plato's philosophy where we have studied about ideal state. In Aristotle's philosophy, you can see Aristotle's uh, ideal state. In Machiavelli's philosophy, we can see ideal prince. So likewise, in Jiauddin Barani's theory, we see a theory of kingship or a theory of ideal sultan. Sultan means the king or the emperor. Jiauddin Barani belonged to medieval times of 14th century. And Jiauddin Barani worked as a scholar in Muhammad bin Tughlaq's court. So Muhammad bin Tughlaq was a great administrator in India who has changed capital from Delhi to Calcutta and Calcutta to again Delhi. So, in his court, Jiauddin Barani was a scholar. And as a medieval thinker, Barani considered politics as a branch of theology and suggested that the king or the sultan should follow the Islamic religious laws and traditions. Being ingrained in Islamic philosophy, Barani suggested that the king should have more knowledge or mature knowledge about the Islamic principles, particularly the principles related to Sharia. Islamic fundamental law is called as Sharia. So a king should invariably know and he should have knowledge and acquaintance with the Islamic principles of Sharia. So as a medieval thinker, Barani considered politics as a branch of theology and suggested that the king or the Sultan should follow the Islamic religious laws and traditions. So the Islamic laws and religions, the traditions should be the basis of the king and his administration according to Jiauddin Barani. And most importantly, Jiauddin Barani visualized a king or Sultan with unique qualities of God-fearing nature, courage and benevolence. So, he has written so many books. In all his books, he has envisioned, he has visualized a king. And that king, he calls it as Sultan. So that Sultan should have certain unique qualities. Among these qualities, the king should need to be God-fearing in nature. He should be fearful about God. He should be fearful about what is good and what is bad, what is proper and what is improper, what is just and what is unjust. What is dharma and what is adharma? So likewise, the king need to have a sense of judgment on goods and bads. That shows the God-fearing nature. And the king also need to have the courage. Courage means uh, the bravery that a king required to face any kind of untoward incident or any external aggression or any upheaval in the kingdom. So this shows the courage of the king. And besides this, a king need to have the benevolence. He should be very kind enough to the welfare of the people, the public welfare. 
and he should be very hospitable so all these unique qualities like god fearing nature courage and benevolence should combine together in one person called the king and that king in turn is called as a sultan so a sultan who is also a king is a visualized personality of jayauddin barani who need to have certain unique qualities among these qualities the first quality is god fearing nature second one is courage and third one is benevolence and the delhi sultanate of tughlaq conducted the administration under the principles of sharia and precepts of ulama as we all know the muslims consider sharia as the fundamental law so and the precepts of ulama so that means ulamas are the scholars the islamic scholars who interpret the sharia according to the changing times and traditions so according to the precepts of ulama and principles of sharia delhi sultanate of tughlaq conducted the administration so in this context jiauddin barani was born and he has written books and he has evaluated the role of the state and king and he has envisioned a king with certain unique qualities and he has suggested some 24 suggestions advices to the king on how to become a powerful king by himself so delhi sultanate of tughlaq mohammed bin tughlaq conducted the administration under the islamic principles of shariat law and precepts of ulama so in this context jiauddin barani was born and brought up and he has uh, enliven himself to these conditions and jiauddin barani suggested certain measures to the sultan in his works and made an effort to address the problems of his contemporary times so during the medieval times we all know there was feudalism there was orthodoxy there was exploitation like when there was social division among the hindus among the muslims and in various religions of that time and besides this there are also social evils like untouchability child marriages uh, early widowhood to women sati system so these are all some of the social evils that were prevailing in medieval societies so to address these problems of medieval societies which are contemporary to jiauddin barani he has suggested certain measures to his sultan in all his uh, academic works how to deal with these problems and these efforts bear fruit and these efforts were combined in his many books in today's uh, class we'll be have we'll be having a, a strict lesson plan firstly we should know about uh, jiauddin barani's life and works where he has born and what are his uh, family background what are his academic works and everything and after that we'll be discussing about his contemporary times and his philosophical method and after that we'll be discussing about his theory of king or the ideal sultan in this ideal sultan there are four important aspects one is he discusses about the origin of kingship after that he has also discussed about the qualities of king after that he'll be discussing the obligations of king in the obligations of king. and after that in his work he has also discussed important advices to the king as i have told you in the beginning itself barani has given certain 24 advices to the king so these advices are also part of our the, the theory of kingship which he calls it as ideal sultan so to start with he has detailed about the origin of kingship and after that he has discussed about the quality of the king after that the obligations of king and lastly he has uh, given certain 24 advices to the king so these advices are to be read so the, this is how the theory of kingship of jiauddin baraki barani has to be understood last we will make a critical analysis critical evaluation of the whole lesson 
So to start with, Jalaluddin Barani was a medieval Indian philosopher, belonged to 14th century AD, as born in 1285 and died in 1358. In fact, Barani born in a very royal family. Uh, he led a very luxurious life during the early part of his life. And he has led a very prestigious life as a scholar in Muhammad bin Tughlaq's court. But later in the last part of the life, he was imprisoned for so many offenses, for, Romanus, uh, for the writings that he has made. And he was imprisoned for so many times. And he died with poverty and destitution. So that's how the iron of his life started with royal comforts in the beginning and ended with extreme poverty and destitution. So Jayavadin Barani was a medieval Indian philosopher. He belonged to 14th century AD. He, has born, he was born in 1285, that means 13th century, last decades of 13th century. And he died in uh, the sixth decade of 14th century. That's called 1358. Though he led a royal life, royal comfort in most of his life, Barani was imprisoned in his last leg of life and he experienced poverty and destitution. So as a scholar, he has expressed so many views and these views need not necessarily coincide with the views of the rulers. Whenever the, the, the rulers have a divergent views of the scholars, the victims are generally the scholars and scholars will be imprisoned. This is also true in the case of Barani also. Jayauddin Barani has expressed certain views in his works and for this offense, he was imprisoned and he was also witnessed. He, he was witnessing poverty in his life. And he has also witnessed destitution in his life. So the first part of his life was very royal and he has led the, his life with all his comforts. But in the last part of his life, he was imprisoned and he died with poverty and destitution. He has, he has written certain important uh, classical works. Among these works, two important works are worth mentioning related to political theory and political philosophy. The first one is Tariq A. Firoz Shahi. Tariq A. Firoz Shahi is an important work. The second one is Fatwa A. Jahandari. Fatwa A. Jahandari. Tariq A. Firoz Shahi. Fatwa A. Jahandari. So these are the two important works. In these works, Jayauddin Barani has expressed his views on ideal sultan and ideal polity. So here has, uh, we have given uh, the books here. One is Firoz Shahi and the other one is uh, a Fatwa Ai Jahangari. So Fatwa Ai Jahangari is in Urdu language. So these are the two important books related to political science, particularly political theory, and philosophy. In these two works, Jaya Jayauddin Barani has expressed his views on ideal state, ideal polity, and ideal sultan. So these are the two important books. Tariq I Firoz Shahi, that's the first one. Second one is Fatwa I Jahan Dari. This is the second one. And besides these two works, he has also written so many other works, which include Sana Ai Muhammadi, Sana Ai Muhammadi, Salat Ai Kabir, Sana Ai Muhammadi, Salat Ai Kabir, Masir Ai Sadat, Masir Ai Sadat, Hazrat Nama, Tariq Ai Barmikia. So these are the other works that he has written. But as far as political science and political theory is concerned, we should concentrate more on Tariq I Firoz Shahi and Fatah I Jahandari. So these are the two important works in which Jayauddin Barani has expressed his views on 
the kingdom, the kingship, the ideal sultan, the qualities of ideal sultan, and the advices that ideal sultan need to follow, and the modus operandi for establishing an ideal polity. So this is how, as discussed about king, statecraft, revenue administration, judicial administration, army, organizing army, and various other aspects in these two books. So Tariq I Firoz Shahi, Fatwa I Jahandari. These are the two important uh, works that are related to the views on ideal sultan and ideal polity of uh, Jiauddin Barani. Barani's other works include Sana I Muhammadi, Salat I Kabir, Masir I Sadat, Hazrat Nama, Tariq I Barmikia. So these are the many important works that he has written. But, the, but for the political science point of view, the Tariq I Firoz Shahi, Fatwa I Jahandari. These are the two important works. Now let us discuss about uh, the contemporary times of Barani. As we all know, uh, Barani made his life in 14th century, as uh, born in 1285 and died in 1358. So his contemporary times marked the rise of Islam and Muslim rule with Khalji dynasty succeeded by Tughlaq dynasty. So the medieval period of Indian history is with Muslim rule and the rise of Islam and Muslim rule with the Khalji dynasty which is succeeded by Tughlaq dynasty. These are the two important dynasties that have ruled many parts of India for our two to three centuries. They are very influential rulers. So Khalji dynasty and Tughlaq dynasty these are the two important uh, dynasties that have in fact sowed the seeds for the strengthening of Islam in Indian society and have established Muslim rule in many parts of Indian society. And in this Muslim rule, the supremacy of Turks, Afghans, Persians, Arabians, Abyssinians, and Egyptians in the royal court. In the court of the king, there are two types of Muslims. One is the Indian Muslims, the second one is foreign Muslims. Among the foreign Muslims, we have Turks, Afghans, Persians, Arabians, Abyssinians, and Egyptians. So these Muslims were given upper hand. These Muslims are considered to be primary and other Muslims, particularly the Indian Muslims, were leading a life with the second grade importance. So the supremacy of Turks, Afghans, Persians, Arabians, as say Abyssinians and Egyptians in the royal court of uh, the kings, particularly the Muslim kings in Delhi Sultanate and also in Khilji dynasty and Tughlaq dynasty. These foreign Muslims have an upper hand. They used to occupy very important and influential administrative positions, army positions, and they used to give advices to the king. And they were the, uh, the members of the inner quarter of the king. So the supremacy of Turks, Afghans, Persians, Arabians, Abyssinians, and Egyptians in the royal court is an important aspect of. Uh, the contemporary conditions of uh, Jayauddin Barani. And likewise, there, were the, there was feudalism in the Indian society. Each feudal lord owning thousands of acres of land, hundreds of acres of land, tens of acres of land. So based on the land ownership patterns and also based on the positions in the army, various positions were given like Khan, Malik, Amir, Sipah Salar, Sari Khalil. So this is how the landed gentry were there and soldiers class was also there. Now that means Indian society has experienced social divisions and economic divisions. Social divisions based on the Indian Muslims and foreign Muslims on the one hand among the Muslims. And among the Hindus, the Chaturvarna system or the caste system, subcaste system, 
that has divided the society into various segregations. This is something. And economically also, Indian society was categorized into various classes based on the land ownership patterns. If a person owns huge amounts of land, he is called as Khan. A little less amount of land is called Malik. And after that, Amir, Sepah Salah, Sari Khalil. So this is how there are different classes of people, both in the landed gentry and also in the soldiers. So this is an important aspect of uh, the medieval society, where social equality and economic equality are virtually missing. And uh, there are various social classes and economic classes prevalent in medieval society. And likewise, there are also educated classes. The whole mass of the population is uneducated. That's something. But there are certain administrative, scholarly and educated classes. They are called as ulema. And these ulemas are responsible for appointing causes and maulvis. And causes and maulvis are uh, the teachers in the Islamic madrasas and also in other schools throughout the country. So, educated classes like ulemas were appointed as quasis and maulis in various areas. So, the contemporary times of Barani is a unique one filled with the rise of Islam and Muslim rule with the Khalji dynasty and the Tughlaq dynasty. This is one thing. And supremacy of Turks, Afghans, Persians, Arabians, Abyssinians, and Egyptians in the royal courts. That's the second important aspect. And thirdly, there were landed gentry and there were also different uh, grades and gradations in the army classes, soldiers class, the like Khan, Malik, Amir, Sepah Salah, and Sarai, Khalil, and various other social classes and economic classes. And besides these classes, there are also educated classes like ulemas. And these ulemas are appointed as Qazis and Maulis as teachers. The Qazis and Maulis are called as the teachers at the primary level and at the high school level. So this is how the society was segregated on economic basis and social basis. And besides this, there are so many scholars in the court of Muhammad bin Tughlaq and various other kings. The Persian scholars like uh, Hassan Nizami, Minhas al Siraz, Amir Khusro, Ayn al Malik Multani. So these are uh, some of the scholars. These scholars have contributed for literature and culture. And likewise, there are also revenue collectors like Kurds, Magdamas, Chaudhrys, and these are all like uh, Munsafs and Patwaris and Patels in South India. So these are all the revenue collectors at different levels, at the village level, at the mandal level, and various other levels. Of course, these uh, revenue officials are mainly from Hindu castes. So this is uh, the picture of medieval society in India when Jayauddin Barani was living. Now let us see the philosophical method of uh, Barani. In a philosophical method, in all his works, Barani has uh, adopted the historical method. And he made an analogy between the contemporary conditions of his times and also the past history, historical events, the past history and present history. So he made a bridge between the past and present and adopted historical method. And he was drawing analogies and examples more and more to draw conclusions on his uh, theoretical precepts. So this is how he adopted historical method and made analogy with contemporary conditions. And likewise, Jayavadhyan Barani has considered politics as a branch of theology. He considered politics as a, a, a branch of theology and he says the Islamic influence, the influence of religion, particularly the Islam, the Sharia and other laws of the Islam 
is very much there on the politics, political system, political institutions, political personalities of his own times. So that's why he considered politics as a branch of theology. And likewise, Jiauddin Barani has, a, has also followed the observation method at a royal participant. One advantage that Barani has, which others are lacking, is he is a part of the establishment, he is part of the royal court. So as a royal participant, he can even observe a very nook and corner of uh, the administrative necessities and he can draw conclusions. That's why his method is mainly the observation method as a royal participant. Now let us see the theory of kingship, the ideal sutta. The theory of kingship has uh, four important aspects. One is uh, we'll be discussing about the origin of kingship. After that, we'll be discussing the qualities of a king. After that, we'll be discussing the obligations of the king. And after that, we'll be discussing the important advices to king. The J.R. Jayavdin Barani has rendered about 24 advices to a true sultan. Sultan means an ideal king is uh, called as a sultan. So, to start with, he has discussed about the origin of kingship. So his uh, theory of kingship is a divine origin theory. He says uh, God has created the kingdom and king is the representative of God to remove evils from society and establish justice and order. So king is the representative of God. So people need to have obedience to law, obedience to king, obedience to state. So law obedience, obedience to state, obedience to sultan are inevitable for people because king is created by, king, by, by the God and king is considered as a representative of God. Why king was created? The purpose of his creation is to remove evils from the society and establish justice and order in the society. So this is the purpose of the king. And king should not claim himself as a deputy of God. Though the God has created the king, the king should not claim himself as a deputy of God. King should only imbibe the divinity of God, but he should not claim the form of God. That means he should not claim himself as a deputy of God. And king should implement the principles of God and his prophet. The principles of uh, the God and also the principles of his prophet. Here in the process, honor and dishonor are attached to God. The king makes honor, the God feels satisfied. If the kings may dishonor, that hurts the God. So that means the honor and dishonor are attached to God. So maintaining the administration and conducting the governance is something linked to the divine power, divine duty, divine obligation. So honor and dishonor of the activities of the king are linked to the God. So this is another important aspect. And now let us see what are the qualities of a king that Barani has discussed. The first and foremost quality of a king, according to Jiauddin Barani is, an ideal king should have determination and should be firm and consistent. So a king should always be firm. He should not vacillate. He should not waver. He should not uh, be indecisive. He should take quick decisions. And he may take decisions a little late, but he should be determined in implementing the decisions. Determination is required for the implementation of decisions. So an ideal king should have determination and should be firm and consistent in implementation of the decisions. So the firmness of the king, the determination of the king, the consistency of the king, and not having the habit of postponing the decisions, wavering mentality, procrastination should not be there in the king. This is one thing. Secondly, 
An ideal king should promote goodness and righteousness among the people. So an ideal king is one who promotes goodness among the people and righteousness among the people. In fact, in every society, there are good and evil. There is always a constant struggle between good and evil. So in case of a struggle between good and evil, the king should always support the goodness. And he should also promote goodness and he should motivate the people to be righteous and goodness and promote goodness. So this is how an ideal king should act himself as a icon of goodness and he should also promote goodness and promote righteousness among the people and he should motivate the people towards goodness and righteousness. So this is the second important aspect that Barani has discussed. And thirdly, an ideal king should hate laziness and carelessness. That means a king should always be dynamic, a king should always be attentive, a king should always be assertive. He should not be lazy, he should not vacillate, he should, be, he should not be indecisive. So that means an ideal king should hate laziness and carelessness. He should be very careful towards the needs of the people and he should be available to the people, accessible to the people, both for their internal problems and external problems. So a king, an ideal king, hate laziness and carelessness. This is also an important uh, quality that uh, Jiauddin Barani has discussed. After that, an ideal king should formulate a timetable and follow it. So he says, every king needs to have a timetable timetable of activities that he has to perform right from the rise of rise from the bed to going to the bed so that means all his daily activity should be put into a strict timetable and you should formulate a timetable and you should follow it without any major deviations so this is an important quality of the king and thirdly an ideal king should not develop love or permanent belonging to worldly matters. So that means he uh, should not develop any love or affection for the worldly matters. Or he should not uh, have the habit of uh, permanent belongingness to worldly matters. He should be detached to everything. At the same time, he should do his bit for the promotion of the society. So he should not develop love or permanent belonging to worldly matters. Here, a kind of uh, religious philosophy comes into vogue, and Barak Barani advised the king not to be attached to anything and he should do his duties by God's grace. So an ideal king should not develop love or permanent belongingness to worldly matters. That's one thing. And after that, an ideal king should be thankful to God and regularly bestow favor to the people. As the God has created the king and king was the creation of God, a king should always be thankful to the God. In fact, God has given an opportunity for the king to prove himself to articulate his uh, abilities, to fulfill his obligations. So it's an opportunity given by Almighty or God, the divine power to the king. So an ideal king should be thankful to God and he should regularly bestow favor to the people. So the king should do his bit for the welfare of the people. He should regularly bestow his efforts for the welfare of the people. So he should be thankful to the king on the one hand. On the other hand, he should be regularly bestow favor to the people. King has given, uh, king was given energies by the God. So these energies have to be properly utilized by the king. And to that extent, people should be benefited from the qualities of the king. So an ideal king should be thankful to God for giving him an opportunity to serve the people as a public servant 
and he should bestow his efforts for the welfare of the people. So this is also another important quality of a king. Now let's see what are the obligations of king. According to Jiauddin Baraki, a king need to have certain functions. With these functions, the king earns good name and fame in the society. These are called as the obligations of king. The first and foremost obligation of king, according to Barani, is a sultan must employ power in protection and maintenance of Islam. He should be a protector of his religion. He should, he should protect his uh, religion, Islam. A sultan must employ power in protection and maintenance of Islam. That is the first important uh, obligation of the king. So that means maintenance of order, maintenance of religion, maintenance of uh, divine message, implementation of the divine message. So in that process, Sultan must employ power in protection and maintenance of Islam. This is one thing. And secondly, a true Sultan must implement Sharia and suppress unorthodoxy and punish infidelity. So a true Sultan must implement the Sharia. Sharia means the Islamic fundamental law. Muslims follow the principles of Sharia and precepts of ulemas. Ulemas are the interpreters or commentators of the Sharia. So a true Sultan must implement the Sharia and a true Sultan must suppress the unorthodoxy. So the society is orthodoxical, Islam is orthodoxical. So all the orthodoxical principles should be followed. The traditions of orthodoxy are to be followed without any deviation. And if the king finds any deviation, and if people are becoming unorthodoxy, the king should suppress that. And he should establish the Sharia, the importance of Sharia in the society. So a true Sultan must implement Sharia and suppress unorthodoxy and punish infidelity. So he should punish the blasphemous people who criticize the God and who abuse the king, who abuse the God. So they are called as infidels. So the king here, he has given three important aspects. One is he should implement the Sharia. Secondly, he should suppress the anarchy. And third one, he should punish the infidels. So this is how, uh, these are the obligations of the king. And after that, the king, a true sultan, should dispense strict justice and appoint only pious people to various offices. So a true sultan should dispense strict justice. A speedy justice, qualitatively good justice, and he should satisfy the people in all their legal problems with good judgments and fair judgments. So the king should need to have wisdom in making judgments and fairness, with all fairness. So a true sultan should dispense strict justice and he should appoint only pious people to various offices. In every royal court, there are high offices like ministers, high officials, army cadre, army officials. So these are all various uh, offices that are available in every kingdom. So a true sultan should dispense strict justice and appoint people to various offices. And these people should be pious, pious means sacred. Only sacred people with the determination and adherence to Islamic principles of Sharia are only eligible to get appointed to various offices. That's why a true Sultan should dispense strict justice and appoint only pious people to various offices. And likewise, a true Sultan must prepare his army with renewed vigor. So a true Sultan, he should prepare his army to face any eventuality, either from neighborhood, 
or from any other state. He may face war or warlike situation in any part of his kingdom. So in such a case, a, a true Sultan must prepare his army with renewed vigor. So that is uh, a very important uh, obligation of the king. He should prepare himself for any outward incident, external aggression, war, marching by neighboring countries, army marching by neighboring countries. So these are all the obligations of the king. And a true Sultan must follow market control policy. In the market control policy, the king should declare prices. He should fix prices for certain important commodities. And there should not be any deviation in the prices of the commodities. So this is how he can control the market. The market control policy is an economic reform that Jiauddin Baraki has suggested to the king. So a true Sultan must follow the market control policy. He should control the market by declaring the prices to various commodities, consumables, and order the traders and commercial people, merchants, not to sell any good beyond the price that is fixed by the state. So that's how a true Sultan must follow a market control policy. Controlling the market is another important aspect, another important obligation of the king. And lastly, public welfare and hospitality. A king need to have public welfare in his mind. He should uh, always maintain public welfare. He should help the sick. He should help the uh, people with the disabilities. He should help the poor people. So likewise, public welfare should be given the primary importance and he should also need to have hospitality. So these are the obligations of the king. Besides these obligations and origins of king, the qualities of king, Jayauddin Baraki has suggested certain advices to the king. King he calls him as a true sultan. A true Sultan need to have uh, some 24 advices from Jayauddin Barani. And uh, the best among these advices we'll discuss here. The first one is, a king should live a pompous life with all comforts to get respect from people. So that means the king should uh, be a model to the people. He should live a pompous life with all the comforts, with all the material comforts. Then only people give him respect. The king gets his legitimacy from his appearance. When he appears to be a poor people or destitute person, people do, do not uh, care him. That's why he, Barani says, king should live a pious life, pompous life, with all the comforts to get respect from the people. And he should behave like a unique personality. He should behave himself like a, a unique personality. This is an important aspect. And secondly, king should evolve a system of administration, army, intelligence, and judiciary with persons of high integrity and character. So that means for all the higher positions and influential positions in army, administration, intelligence, and judiciary, only people with high integrity and character should be appointed and people with fickle mindedness, people with immature mentality, people with indecisiveness cannot be appointed. So people with high integrity and character, and he has suggested some 54 qualities for the people to be appointed as various employees in his court, in administration, army, intelligence, and judiciary. So that means, the people to be appointed for higher offices should have high integrity and character. And this character is defined in 54 qualities by Jayauddin Baraki in his book. And 
Among the other advisors, the king should bestow his efforts on public welfare and economic prosperity. They should be given primary importance. So that means public welfare should be given primary importance. After that, economic prosperity should be given primary importance. So these are, uh, after that, good policies, rules and regulations are to be framed. The king in consultation with his ministers and noblemen, scholars, he should formulate the policies. And these policies include the rules and regulations should be rational and should be acceptable to the wider sections of the society. So good policies, rules and regulations are to be framed by the king. This is also in the suggestion. After that, Jiaudin Barani feels that the king should maintain determination and sovereign power. He should protect himself. He should be determined. And with that determination, he can protect his sovereign power. Sovereign power means the supreme power of the king and his citizens and their associations is called as internal sovereignty. And externally, the king should maintain his political independence with the power of formulative policies independently by himself without the interference of outside forces. So that's how a king should be in a position to maintain his sovereign power and its maintain determination. And he should also strengthen the karas. Karas means treasury. So unless the king is economically sound. He cannot implement the public welfare policies. That's why he has suggested a tax structure. And the prevailing tax structure at that time of uh, his living, the contemporary tax system consisting of five taxes. The first one is Usha. Usha means a tax levied on Muslims, Muslim landlords. And one tenth of agricultural production of Muslims should be taken away as a, as a, a tax. That tax is called as usher. And second one is kiraz. A kiraz is a, a land tax of Hindus. So the first one is a Muslim land tax. The second one is a Hindu land tax. The Muslims can only pay one tenth of their agricultural production as tax. But Hindus are asked to pay one third to one half, one third to half of the total produce by Hindus from their agricultural product as a tax. And third one is Jakat. Jakat was paid by rich Muslims. And Jakat was paid by rich Muslims, generally two and a half percent of uh, their annual income is to be paid as Jakar. It's only for the helping of uh, the poor Muslims. In his contemporary societies, the economic inequalities are so glaring that there are three sections of society. One is the upper classes, the second one is the middle classes, and third one is the lower classes. So the Jakat, which the rich for Muslims used to pay, or asked to pay, which includes two and a half percent of their annual income. That was to be paid as a zakat. And rich Muslims were to pay for helping the poor Muslims. And likewise, Khans. Khans is a plundered money from the external aggressions or wars. So if a quantum of money is found from plundering the neighboring kingdoms or any mighty kingdoms, so one-fifth of the plundered amount goes to the treasury. And the remaining four-fifths of the amount will be distributed among the soldiers. So this is uh, called as the plundered money. Lastly, there's another tax called zizia. It's a tax on non-Muslims. So this is how the tax structure in the contemporary Muhammad bin Tughlaq's uh, regime was very religious and Jayavuddin Baraki wanted to 
give a suggestion to the king to strengthen the treasury system and the karaj system so as to facilitate the king to undertake so many public welfare activities even to undertake the public welfare activities everyone need to have uh, money in his hands without money nothing can be achieved that's why strengthening the treasury is the first and foremost important aspect that every king need to have so that's why he has suggested the strengthening of karas karasmis the treasury in fact in the prevailing tax system there are five important uh, taxes asha kiras zakat khans and zazia these are the five important taxes that were there in the prevailing society so the asha is the first one tenth of the agricultural production of the muslims who are involved in agriculture so the muslim landlords and muslim land gentry need to pay so one tenth of agricultural production as a tax an agricultural tax to the state that's called as asha and likewise the kiras kiras is also a land tax but this is to be paid by hindus so for hindus the land tax is one third of uh, the total produce one third to half of the total produce of the hindus they need to pay it as a tax so this is how the tax structure was divided on religious lines and third one is zakat zakat is uh, an important tax which has 2 and 1/2 percent on the annual income of the rich muslims and this amounts are to be collected for helping the poor muslims and fourthly the khans khans means the plundered money that uh, the king and his soldiers have received after the victories on the neighboring kingdoms or in the wars so once the money is plundered from the foreign land one fifth of the plundered money goes to the treasury and the remaining four fifth of the plundered money is to be distributed among the soldiers and likewise there is also a system of zizya zizya tax on non muslims so by imposing the taxes in a very rational manner the king can strengthen the karas karas means the treasury system so this is all about uh, saudian baraki now i'll make a critical evaluation of uh, barani's uh, political thinking barani has uh, given two important ideas one is the theory of kingship or true sultan and second one is the theory of ideal polity ideal sultan and ideal polity so in today's class we have discussed about the concept of ideal king ideal sultan of uh, jawdin barani in which we have uh, discussed about the contemporary conditions of uh, jawdin barani and after that the important works that he has written the method the philosophical method that he has followed after that we have discussed about uh, the theory of kingship that uh, jawdin barani he has given in his two books two important books so in that first we have discussed about the origin of kingship and after that we have discussed about the obligations of the kingship the qualities of the kingship king and also we have discussed about the advices the 24 advices that are given to the king by barani so among these 24 advices we have picked up some important very important advices so this is how jawdin barani has played an important role very prominent role in the medieval societies and he has established a kind of relationship between religion and politics and he asked the kings to be religious and he has also asked the kings to be rational in imposing taxes so this is all about jawdin barani Thank you friends thank you very much